in environmental engineering at Northeastern University. She did her PhD with Dave Stencil and James Staley in civil and environmental engineering and microbiology at University of Washington in 2003. Um, she has a, a private sector experience in uh, uh, engineering, environmental engineering. She did her master's at Northeastern University, where she is currently an assistant professor. Uh, April Gu is a very experienced nanotoxicologist. She has a broad uh, menu of research areas uh, looking at micropollutants using toxicogenomics. And I believe that this is uh, the subject of her talk to us today about toxicogenomics for ecotoxicity screening of environmental pollutants. Uh, welcome, April Gu. Right. Thank you so much. For this opportunity today for me to here to share some of the stuff we learned uh, while we were investing and asking some questions along this direction of the research. So the title of today's topic is Application of Toxicogenomics for Ecotoxicity Assessment and Screening of Environmental uh, Pollutants, not specific to NINO, but a variety of uh, environmental pollutants. And uh, for those on our uh, webinar, I want to just point out really quickly, I'm sorry that I, I didn't know that this uh, presentation cannot be really operated in a PowerPoint. So I had a, some animation on some sequential show up of certain things that won't be show up today as I go through this. Um, Give me a second to get used this. So started with a really quick motivation for this project. It started with a little bit of broader, actually, challenges, questions I had. So based on the uh, Amer American Academy of Engineering, one of our first uh, 21st century's grand challenge is to provide access to clean water. Notice the two key words. Access to me actually means abundance, plenty of it. But also there's clean. That means not only plenty, but it has to be high quality to be beneficial use for whatever purpose you have. So in, in addition to the continuous efforts we all have in this field, uh, working on the challenges we already recognized, including the water shortage, different regions, different uh, locations, geographic locations of the world of US, as well as uh, to, to fight against the continued deterioration of our entire water body in many ways, nutrient eutrophication, et cetera. But to me, one of another third area actually probably got more attention recently is actually challenges in the second and third section is challenges in regulation and risk assessment framework. And this challenge, I think, had brought more attention lately with the emerging or recognized uh, uh, risks and harmful effects with, to environment as well as to human associated with the so-called so uh, contaminants of emerging concern. And this including a, a variety of classification of compounds, including EDCs, if many of you heard endocrine disrupting compounds, pharmaceuticals, PPCPs, personal care products, and of course recently we add another category is nanomaterials. So the question is with all this dunking a, a higher number of pollutants coming in, with unknown risks associated with them, how do we even start with regulate them and understand them? So I think for any regulation to be in put in place, and you have to understand the uh, risk associated with them. So my question start with there. And then before I go to, into specific uh, challenge associated with toxicity assessment, let's review really quickly what do we do and what practice do we do today. So for those who are familiar with water quality monitoring for so toxicity associated, you basically have to do a whole animal or a whole organism based uh, in water, at least for water wastewater, we do wet tests, for, uh, refers to whole affluent toxicity test. So what does it do? Basically, you pick a specific aquatic organism of interest, either Daphnia, fathead man, or those EPA specified fish or shrimp or algae, and then grow them certain then exposed to different dilutions of your water or wastewater samples, then observe some phenotype endpoint. And the phenotype endpoint that normally we do is either growth inhibition or death or offspring reduction. So for things like that. So this kind of test are routinely practiced great, give us some relative information on the toxicity associated with certain sample. But we really do not know what's the toxicity maximum behind it. We just know, OK, it killed 10 fishes. Right? We don't know what, cause, what are the causing agents and what's the mechanism behind it. If you want to ask further questions, I really want to know what are the toxins in my water causing all this effect, then you have to go through so-called toxicity identification evaluation, TIE test. And those tests, to be simply put, 
uh, consists of a larger battery, a tiered battery of physical chemical extraction separation of your samples into, let's say, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, whatever, depending on the operation definition of it. Then you do follow-up toxicity evaluation, similar to the wet testing. Then kind of trace back, oh, it seems like toxicity come from that portion or come from that portion. That's pretty much the logic of how you do it. And as you can imagine, I mean, it is very labor and resource intensive. To do one TIE test, it sometimes takes up to months to do one, one sample to even get to the bottom of it. And it requires very sophisticated instruments and labor. And at the end, not necessarily reflect the bio effects either. Maybe you add extraction reagent or whatever. You already change the nature of the sample sometimes. So there are sure challenges associated. So the question with all this is that how do we use this type of approach to, to face the larger number of pollutants, for example, EDC alone, I think, uh, if I remember right, last time I checked, the EPA had a three-tiered approach to do screen it, and they, they proposed 8,600, if I remember right, some number like that, uh, candidates of just EDCs. So as you can imagine, I think one of the most recent ESNT review paper published in 2009 pointed out clearly that if using current approach to screen all these larger number of pollutants, they are ever increasing, it's going to take decades. So I think that's the, basically the challenge. And then so my question is, how do we screen in the increasing and ever large number of CECs, a contaminants emerging concern, and evaluate their harmful effects feasibly? And the, the, I would, in addition to the current practice, hope we can search for some alternative approach that can provide us a little bit in additional information, uh, such as, for example, I would like to reflect not only the overall toxic effect, but also, can we provide some uh, toxic mechanism information? Can we get more informative and reliable multiple endpoints rather than single deaths or li uh, live type of uh, phenotype one endpoints? And can we get information suggestive of causal agents? And on top of that, as engineering background, I'm thinking, no matter how great your approach is, if it is so resource intensive and nobody can really afford to use it, it's not going to help that much. So bottom line, I want something really physical and economically possible and also can able to deliver the, of the, the desired trees we would like to. So with this question in mind, I search literature, I think toxic genomics came out into some approach at least to provide not all the list I want on my wish list, but some of the aspects seem to be advantage to give us some information. So everything starts from there. So what is and why toxic genomics? To be put in the layman words, toxic genomics refers to we use biological responses to toxicant as a way to measure toxicity or toxicity, toxicant presence. So in, basically, we use changes in gene expression pattern to our organism as a way to see, oh, indicative, there is toxicity effect, and what causing it. And I apologize for this messy slide, because the reason I mentioned earlier is supposed to be animation with one information come up another. Now it doesn't show up. So what I'm trying to say, the first information I want to show you is that when the toxicant is in exposure, in contact with any organism or cell line, the response starts with the transcription level, so with the genetic level. Then further down, go to translation level, making proteins, right? Then proteins are the one eventually leading to all the phenotype observation we can see with the structure change, and metabolic uh, change, or any other death, or eventually death. So all lead to that. So, Toxic genomics basically zoom in the first step of a response. Instead of doing the final phenotype endpoint, we're looking at the transversal level effect. And uh, so what is the technology? Uh, we can, before I go to what the technology we can use to do toxic genomics, I, I put together a quick uh, list of advantages I think we can use this approach. And uh, first, uh, like I mentioned earlier, with this kind of information, because it's a global response to a toxicant, we can review some toxic and specific mechanisms, so-called mode of action. And we can reduce uncertainty because of the more sensitive characteristic of multiple endpoints rather than one single phenotype uh, toxicity we can observe itself. And because we, we are observing at the transcription level, not waiting until we reach to the phenotype damage, we can observe sublethal effects. Because for the other one, you have the dose enough so you can see death or some. So we can observe sublethal uh, sub and low dose or potentially even uh, long-term effects of a toxicants indicative as transcriptional level. Then at the end, if an endpoint can be quantitative, then it can be potentially incorporated into the risk and regulatory framework that started with my first uh, motivation. 
And uh, so the current technology commonly used for, for people in the field of toxicogenomics is a microarray. I think many of you may be familiar with. For those who are not, I go through really quickly the concept of it. So you, have, you expose your organism to a toxicant. You wait for a certain period of time. You pick a snapshot. You extract the messenger RNA out of it, then reverse transfer back to cDNA. Then you, hybr you label your cDNA with fluorescence or any other labeling. And then you hybridize with the oligonucleotides or the so-called probes already pre-immobilized on the chip. So there's a couple different ways you can either dab to immobilize or, or in situ synthesize. Now these people can do that. But either way, then you do the hybridization, then observe the, uh, the, the fluorescent signal. That way it gives you an overall of all the genes you're interested in on the chip, who is on, who is not, who is up or down regulated in exposure to toxicant. So this, this approach has been demonstrated by a, by a number of researchers to be very powerful. But I think for, for, for our purpose to screen a larger number of pollutants, it may have some practical limitations. For example, the, the whole procedure is quite complex. You need to be trained, advanced expertise to be able to carry this well and deliver really good results. And it's really still really relatively costly. I think each chip to today, last time I checked, is still within 200 to 500 dollars, just one chip. So if one chip, you can only use the ones for one sample, and then that's it. So as you can imagine, with all the duplicates, number of samples, so it's getting. And on top of that, because of the resource intensiveness, normally people can only pick one or two time spot. So you expose, you, you, you arbitrarily or predetermine one time slot, take one sample. So you really do not know overall, over time, how the organisms respond. Do you know you pick the right time or not? So questions like that. So my question boils down to then, there is any other alternative technology in addition to microarray can give us similar information? And then one alternative is a whole cell array of GFP-infused recombinants. And keep in mind that this, the microarray can be applied to eukaryotic and any prekaryotic cells, so many cells. But however, for GFP-infused, the limitation is that they only limit to certain cell lines. So for this particular case, we use the E. coli. And the, the principle of GFP-infused uh, whole cell is basically you put a promoter of a specific gene of your interest, the upper stream of the GFP gene, so which is a green fluorescence protein. So if in exposure to a toxicant, a particular gene is involved, that the promoter will be initiated, then that would lead to the downstream translation of the GFP gene, then produce a GFP protein that gives you a fluorescence signal. So almost like a light bulb, every single cell, recombinant cell, is one light bulb will light up if that gene you inserted in him or it would respond to a certain toxicant. And so using this principle, thanks to the uh, advancement in the, uh, modern biotechnologies, now we can construct a library of E. coli recombinant strains of over 2,000 genes in a whole library, and which covers about 50, nearly 50% 50 of the entire genome of E. coli. And then the procedure becomes relatively simple. So you can use the recombinant strings on the plate, uh, on the condensed uh, just microplates and exposed to toxicant. Then you can monitor the OD as an indicator of cell growth rate, as well as the fluorescent signal, which is an indicator of the promoter activity, which is we in interpreted as a gene expression level simultaneously by this machine. Then that gives you the uh, global level gene expression overall profile of organism exposure to a given toxicant. Then based on that, we can process the data, calculate, for example, induction factor, which measures the changes or so-called differentially expressed gene patterns in exposure to a toxicant in comparison to that with no exposure as a control. And uh, so we, we, we are targeted at several different classes of uh, contaminants of emerging concern, like I mentioned earlier including pharmaceuticals, EDC, et cetera. And today, I will focus more on the nanomaterial uh, for today's presentation. And I also want to point out that the endocrine disrupting effect is only relevant to eukaryotic cells. So for our application, we are not observing the endocrine disrupting effect itself, but rather we are observing other toxicity effect endocrine disrupting compounds may have on the prokaryotic cell. I want to clarify that. So I will start with using a nano dioxide as an example. Uh, the reason I think all of you probably all know this, so titanium dioxide has been incorporated in many, many uh, commercial products or 
biomedical applications, and a recent study reported actually real measured concentration in wastewater effluent in a range of from 5 to 50 micrograms per liter. And there's also another report of a similar range of magnitude concentration predicted based on the production in the uh, Switzerland scenario. So um, I will start with a global higher level type of information we can obtain with this approach. Then I will drill down with some of the detailed information with certain specific stress-related uh, pathways. So we examined over 1,700 genes over titanium dioxide. We observed the 500 uh, differentially expressed genes in exposure for at 50 milligram per liter for only two hours. Notice that the toxicity effect is not only depending on the dose as well as for, for time. So for our purpose, because I want to develop something high rate, high throughput pre-screening, so we picked a two hour, so it's a really short test. And uh, this slide summarizes what or globally, uh, overall, what noticeable observation, observation we have seen. So it, every single box represents a specific metabolic pathway associated with uh, prokary uh, prokaryotic cells. So uh, the color coded means that the red ones means that most of the genes in that particular metabolic pathway we found upregulated, so show up as red color. And if it's green, means majority of the genes in that metabolic pathway were downregulated, so they show up green. So some key noticeable things, for example, we found uh, quite a few genes involved in glycan biosynthesis being really upregulated, specifically related to, to glycosphingolipid and lipopolysaccharide peptidoglycan synthesis, which is, uh, for those who are familiar with all these polymers, they are glycan conjugate, right, with lipid from poly or or monosaccharide then conjugated with either protein, amino acid, or lipid to form all these uh, polymers. And they are essential components of cell membrane and cell wall. So to me, indicating that in the cell membrane or wall responses or damage may be the dominating uh, uh, responses to, to the exposure to titanium dioxide. And consistently with the glycan biosynthesis upregulation, we also see amino sugar, for example, acetylglucamine, um, uh, they, are, they are also the part of the, part of the polymer to making uh, peptidoglycan. So they are also indicating that related to membrane uh, synthesis has been upregulated. And in contrast, uh, we noticed uh, quite a few genes related to pyramiding uh, pathways all downregulated. So if you remember the basic uh, uh, nucleotides like uh, uh, cytosine, C, T, cymine, and this, uh, U, uracil. So C, T, U, I think. Those three, at least, are the deriva directly derivatives of pyramiding. So it means that they're, they're downregulated. And one of the possible explanation is that when you have a DNA damage, sometimes a DNA repair, such, such like a nucleotide excision repair pathway, would potentially actually inhibit the transcription effect. Almost like, you know, I'm going to stop you because I'm busy repairing, repairing the DNA damages. So that's one possible explanation. And also, for example, in, in Nocito, it's also another upper-regulated uh, uh, molecule play a role in keeping the cell membrane potential. So overall, that's what we found. And to summarize, so the key highlights of the global in level information we found, there's a lot of genes related seem to be either cell membrane response or cell membrane synthesis. And we know from the literature that all these uh, materials, glycan-related conjugate materials, can actually play a role in protect the cell membrane from chemical attack and also may, may serve in cell, uh, cellular to cellular communication and receptor recognition, so may play a certain role in there. And we also see uh, a, a number of genes related to DNA damage repair that have been differentially uh, changed, and also genes involved in oxidative and the protein stress. So that's the global level information. Now I will zoom in, uh, focus a little bit more just on the DNA damage. And, uh, for DNA damage to pro, uh, prokaryotic cells, depending on how severe the cell ex experienced DNA damage, it may or may not use a different repair pathways. The SOS, so-called SOS DNA damage repair pathway is well known, but that pathway can only be actively initiated when you have severe damage. So when you have lighter damage, so-called if you have not significant amount of single-stranded DNA over than 70 base pair long, that means light, DNA damage, then you have background direct or mismatch or the other type of repair can go on without using SOS response system initiation. 
Then as your damage getting more and more severe, your upregulator up genes such like RECA and LEXA, those are the ones that control the SOS response system, will be active and then it get initiated. And for the most severe damage, you, you have the double-stranded DNA damage, then both of the LEXA and RECA will be really upregulated in response to that. So in our case, based on the gene on, it seems like the titanium dioxide to lead to medium range. So we do see upregulation of Lex A, and we see very mild upregulation of Rec A. And uh, once again, this is another messy slide, need <laughs> animation. So I, uh, key information from this slide I want to go over with you is that for DNA damage, it's actually a very complex process. If you look at the basic uh, toxicology or genetic uh, toxicology, that there are many, many different ways DNA can be damaged uh, through single strand damage, double strand in the dimer formation, alkylation, and there's a list of gamma of ways DNA can be damaged. And then depending the, the, the way it's damaged, there's also a, a gamma of ways DNA can be repaired. And listed on the right-hand side, you can do directly repair if you, you have alkylation type of damage. You can base excision repair. Then you have a nucleotide excision or mismatch repair or double-stranded brick repair. And the one I highlighted in red are the ones we observed for our situation. So in our case, we observed only nucleotide excision repair and the mismatch repair type of gene being changed due to exposure of titanium dioxide. And uh, to zoom even more into detail, I'll give you a really quick look at the, just the mismatch repair. And uh, if you look at the, the sequence or the way the mismatch repair are done to prokaryotic cells, so you have double-stranded DNA, and the top one is considered a sensing string, the bottom one considered anti-sensing, or so-called a daughter string. Normally, you have to form a so-called MALT-HLS complex polymer, uh, MALT-HLS polymer, which can help actually recognize where the mismatch is occurring on the double-stranded DNA. Then they hold on to the DNA almost like not only recognize it, then help to initiate the incision and with the help with the helicase UVRD and the uh, excision enzymes to cut whatever the missed piece off. Then the SSB, which is another, in, uh, another gene, the enzyme of it, which helped to hold the integrity, almost like holding a single-stranded DNA of the sensing string in place, will allow the polymerase of the DNA polymerase to actually work on the complement string to make the complement DNA uh, to, to it. Then once that is done, you do the ligation, then you do the methylation to add a methyl group on the DNA, which indicate how old the DNA are. So that's the whole process of the mismatch uh, DNA repair is done. And all the genes which are circled are the genes are present in our library. And the ones circled in red are the ones really upregulated to many folds. And the ones circled in blue are upregulated or downregulated but in a, to a le lesser extent or less magnitude. But as overall, what I want to show you is that you can see all the genes involved in mismatch repair are really being changed that it is indicative of mismatch repair DNA are occurring during the two hours while we're observing it. So similarly, you can put, summarize that kind of detailed information into a little bit uh, summarized or integral information like it's shown in this particular figure. So the x-axis show the, uh, the, the natural log of an induction factor, which basically measure how much the gene has been changed. And then on the y-axis, I summarize based on their stress uh, function specifically. So as you can tell, I put all the genes who involve in detoxification in one bar, all the genes involved in SOS response in one bar, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of chart can give you overall glance of, for example, this particular case, I switched to nanosilver. It, the, the most obvious one, nanosilver, caused DNA damage. As we can see, the bar level is high. But yet, we do not see the SOS response to be initiated. So once again, may not be to, to the severe level to initiate SOS, but we do see uh, DNA um, uh, d damage. Then we also see for, for nanosilver specifically is ROS production and the redox stress gene is really uh, obvious. And also drug resistance to multi-family facilitator, multi-family facilitator family genes related to uh, efflux or uh, a metal efflux system are also uh, if differentially exchange, uh, be ch uh, changed. So if, you, if we summarize this similar type of information, um, this, in this particular table, I put together all the type of DNA-related repairs on the left-hand side. And on the top are all the materials we exam examined. And the most right column, MMC, stands for metomycin. 
In this case, we use as a positive control because metomycin is a known genotoxin. It causes DNA damage. So it's almost like a standard way to observe DNA damage. So as you can see, it initiated SOS response as, as uh, expected. And if DNA is damaged so severe, it caused double strand uh, repair and also lead to cell division inhibition. That's MMC. But if you look at all the other nanomaterials across all the different types of DNA repair, you can see that all of them, to some extent, can be considered damaging DNA. But if you look really detail how they damage DNA through what way, they're all different. So this slide, basically, I want to show you this kind of information can give you not only, oh, they are damaging DNA toxin, you can actually get a little bit further how and why, what repair pathway they are causing DNA damage and repair. And this figure also uh, gives you an overall glance, a summary of what kind of oxidative stress response we can observe with titanium dioxide. So if you look at the uh, oxidative damage of all the potential uh, ROS production, so you can have super, oxy super oxygen radical, then you can have uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, hydroxyl radical, and for each of them, you have corresponding different enzymes associated with to reduce them, to reduce the toxicity of that particular type of ROS. So for example, we have SOS, uh, S SOX, so-called SOX-R or SOX-S. They, they're regulating a superoxide dismutase series, so salt A, B, and C. I think A and B, they're so associated with different metals, like iron, manganese, copper. They're different metals associated with uh, dismutase. And they can uh, reduce the uh, super uh, oxygen radical into oxygen to make it less toxic. And then also, there is OxyR. If there is another oxidative stress regulator shown on the left hand side, and that gene can regulate uh, hydro, hydroperoxidase, uh, CAT G and CAT E. And they can help reduce the hydro, uh, hydrogen peroxide into uh, water and uh, hydrogen. So the genes are circled with a dark red color are the genes we observe really uh, upregulated to many folds in the library. So as indicative that in this particular case, those series of genes are initiated to, uh, as a response to the oxidative stress. And the glucyanin pathway on the right bottom corner, we didn't see any change uh, in that particular uh, uh, pathway associated with oxidative stress. So, so far, hopefully, I give you a little bit of highlights on what kind of re information we can obtain from this kind of approach and what we can learn from them. Then my next question is, remember my, my started motivation is to develop a high rate screening tool. So my next question is, while well, 2,000 genes is great, can give me a lot of information, but if my purpose is just to really do a quick screening and categorize and classify this compound, that's my goal. Is it really necessary to do the whole 2,000 genes? That's the first question mark I ask myself. Or is, is any other thing I can do to reduce the resource intensiveness of this test? So to answer that, the first thing I said, how about I just try only the stress-related genes? Take off all the other essential genes, metabolic pathways, just focus on stressing, see what I can get. So that's started in my second round of try. So we regrouped, recustomized another library, so-called a stress gene library. In this case, we look at this extensively through the literature and summarized all the genes are known to be somewhat involved in stress response across a different category, functional categories, including SOS, DNA damage, redox, detoxification, drug resistance, protein stress, energy stress, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then we put all them together as a separate library. Then we use this library to screening uh, different material. So basically, this library would just focus telling you, OK, what is type of stress response the cell have to the exposure of toxic end? And like I mentioned earlier, the specific category of focusing on is either related to oxidative stress, DNA damage, membrane stress, or protein, which are actually in a commonly recognized you know, toxicity mechanism, basic toxicity mechanisms. So we can zoom in and focus just on those. And uh, uh, then with that, I, I met in the first round question, I asked myself this, OK, so if with only stress gene related library, what kind of information can we obtain? And how can we apply the information to develop further quantitative endpoints besides just knowing the information and the mode of action? So I will go over some of the typical results we can obtain from just a stress type related library. The first thing we learned is that we found that the, all the genes, uh, if you observe them, they actually have a quite dramatically different temporal patterns, so-called time dependent. So the figure I show here on the x-axis is time in a unit of minutes. And a y-axis, is, again, is the natural log of induction factor. So this three chart shows the 
same gene, OXR, as I showed earlier, OXR is upper regulator, right, for the oxidative damage stress regulating the hydroperoxidase. So as you can see, when, when I expose the same gene to MMC, which is a positive control, metomycin, titanium dioxide, and, and nanosilver, they have completely different expression pattern. And for, for titanium dioxide, they continue increase, increase over the entire two hours. And for the metomycin, they get a peak, then actually goes back down within two hours. Then for, uh, for the um, nanosilver, they go much higher peaker at a later time, then actually start to show the pattern coming back down. So this emphasizes the point I mentioned earlier, is that time is important. As you can imagine, you pick a different time point, you get completely different indication. If you pick a little bit later time, you may think that OXR may not even be on for MMC, but it was on at earlier time, right? So this is the first thing we learned. And the second thing I, second thing I learned is that the, the response is also concentration dependent, which is very promising because if you want to develop anything quantitative, and this is the first thing we examined, so instead of not only having a temporal pattern, if you look at the same gene for the same material, but exposure at different concentration, you can see clearly, for example, the uh, left top one, which is also XR, the same gene, the oxidative stress gene. So at the lower concentrations, almost no response in the green line. And as you increase concentration, response increase to blue line, then you increase concentration to be really up right to the red line. So the similar thing to the top right is another cold shock protein stress gene, CSPB. It's downregulated. As you can see, at low concentration, the green flat, then when you increase concentration, become a little bit downregulated, and further increase concentration to really downregulate it. So we found similar things across many genes to show that they are actually concentration dependent response, means that they can potentially be markers, right? And potentially help you develop those response curves. So that's the two, uh, two things we learned. And the third thing we learned is that if we put all the data we have together to make this kind of profile with x axis is time across the timeline, and the y-axis is all the genes we examine in the library, then we can actually create this type of two-dimensional response profile. And the color here are actually, once again, is quantitatively color-coded. So the more red it is, the more fold change it is, the green is downregulated. So as you can tell, that for different materials, different concentration, you can get actually compound-specific two-dimensional this profile. It's almost like a fingerprint. So this is the third thing we learned. And the next thing we learned is that if, if you do this type of two-dimensional profile, not only for different materials, even for the same material, if I just do different concentration, I can get different fingerprint, different profile. So they're also concentration dependent. And we also learned through uh, the con different concentration range uh, observation, we found that three important things take home message. is number one, there is such a thing called a no effect level. So for any material, depending on what material you're talking about, there is a level, there's no observed transcript level effect. So there's such a detection limit. Then we found out above the detection limit, before you hit to another high point in between, this response is relatively compound specific. It means that it's linked to its MOA. But once you hit a certain saturated over point, it's almost like the cell is trying the best to respond as much as it can, then beyond a certain point, almost have to lead to phenotype from then on, or the damage become entirely global, then kind of mask out the specific response associated with, with MOA, then you lose the specificity. So that's the three important messages we learn by observing this with different concentration. To further illustrate that, this is another figure in a different way to show you the same message. So if you look at the left one with nano silver, at the lower concentration near the threshold, we see three genes has differential change. Then as you increase the concentration, become 15 genes, then increase concentration beyond 19 genes, but there's not in the same gene. And the genes aren't low concentration, actually it's not exactly the same as the one with higher concentration. And the similar thing with titanium dioxide, I mean, at a lower concentration, the gene may not be the same as the higher concentration. So it shows that it's not as we imagine, there's the same set of gene for the same material, just more and more on. It's not like that. It's actually in the entire pathway that, that the way involved are changing with, with, with concentration. So that answers my second question, like what kind of information can I get from the stress gene? Then my next around question is, okay, this looks cool. I got enough for information, seems to be those response dependent, seem to be temporally changing, and I can get compound specific within a certain range. Then my next question is, okay, great. How can I quantify the effect in the point, translate to some into quantitative endpoints people can actually use? 
And then, then we have to depend on those response relationships. And if I succeed with all these questions, get some endpoints, I have to validate my endpoints by comparing to other people's endpoints who are already accepted and established. So that's pretty much leads to my next round of question. Before I go to the toxic uh, quantitative endpoints, the current endpoint people use in toxic genomic field, the only one actually, is no tell. It's so called no observable transcription effect level. It's basically the one I mentioned earlier, it's a threshold. And how do they, so the definition is in the maximum concentration for a chemical at which only cause less than 5% of the gene on. And this 5% is arbitrary. You could say I pick 1% or 2 depending on the variation or error of standards of your, your, your methodology. Then we have to develop a dose response curve. And how do you, how do, you do that? I show you a typical curve, you can do that. So the x-axis is the dosing concentration, and the y-axis is the percentage gene that has changed. As simple as that. So it doesn't matter what gene on, how much it's on. It just say the whole library, 2,000 genes, how many percentage that has, caused, has changed. That's it. And interestingly, most people found there is some sort of dose response associated just with percentage genes turned on. And with that, people determine an OTL. And when I look at this, I said, this is great, but I'm like, but I have so much information beyond that. I know which gene on, I know how much each gene on, I know each category. Can I do something else beside this? And that motivated my second question. Can, can we develop a different endpoint that can incorporate not only the percentage gene on, but what gene on, and by how much? And more importantly, how do I put the time t factor into this endpoint calculation? So that leads to my third round of uh, approach here. So we, we proposed a new uh, toxicogenomic endpoint, so-called the transcriptional effect indicator, tally or tell. Uh, I missed one letter, so the TE, uh, transcriptional effect level indicator, so tally. So tally, hopefully I'm using this uh, particular new proposed endpoint or indicator to incorporate both the number and the level of genes with auto expression as well as the time length involved in the expression pattern. And hopefully this can help us to convert the multidimensional toxicogenomic data into a quantitative toxicity endpoint people can apply. How do we do that? So this is a simplified approach of figure, cartoon figure to show how we did it. So we look at all the information we have, three, three, three different dimension. Then we basically integrated our information one step at a time. We integrate the results over time, and then we integrate the data over gene. Then give us a three dimensional involved in the point that can incorporate all those information we want in it. So, that's great. I mean, the sauce is great. Then my question is, with this uh, new indicator, does the result come out making sense? So what I did the first round is that I used this indicator, used this calculation approach we proposed. I calculated the tally value for all the ices we did for three different, four different materials for each with two different concentration. And I now can calculate the tally for different specific group or specific functional group, not just the entire library anymore. I calculate tally number only for protein stress-related gene, and I calculate it only for membrane stress-related gene. Then I can separate them. So as what you can learn from this figure is that if you look at the overall message, is that some of the genes causing more damage in one category than the other. And then the response for the same material of different concentration varies for each category. But if you look even more detail, for example, if you look at single wall carbon nanotube, we did an original carbon nanotube without oxidation, Compared to the single wall carbon nanotube uh, underscore with OX means we oxidize the nanomaterial to add a carboxy group on the surface just to make the surface function change a little bit. To see it's the same material, just change the function and surface derivative, see how that potential change is toxic effect. And as you can see, by having an oxidized functional group on the surface of a single wall carbon nanotube, it actually increased the membrane stress. So that means this, this carboxy group somehow is involved and play a role in a, in a membrane-related stress or damage. And by increasing the concentration to five, as you can see, the orange bar on the second is the highest one. That's the oxidized single word carbon, uh, carbon nanotube. So this kind of information, by looking at this, I was like, this, this is interesting. They gave me some, some little bit more overall, but yet uh, detailed information about each of them. And then similarly, I can summarize the results in a different format, like for example in a table, 
if you look at all the materials on the left-hand side, nano silver, titanium dioxide, and the taste or rutile, carbon black, fluorine, etc., then on the y-axis now I can put into different type of stress, different type of damage into category. Then I can just put a sign my quantitative either number tally in there or just sign my quantitative star in there. Now you can not only glance look, for example, uh, nano silver, it causes the highest level oxidative stress. That's his most signature. Although directly or indirectly, it also leads to somewhat protein stress, membrane stress. If you look at the carbon black, for example, it's really toxic for both DNA and oxidative uh, stress damage. And if you look at the uh, oxidized single wall carbon nanotube, it causes most membrane stress. So it can give you that kind of semi quantitative comparison now among different materials. Not only what type of potential toxicity they have, and quantitatively do you have a comparison. And uh, then my next question is, OK, this is making sense so far, and give me categorized based comparison. My next question is that, are they uh, absolutely uh, concentration dependent, allow me to develop that so-called dose response curve I wanted? So the next thing we did is that we did all these nanomaterials across the bottom, as you can see, from nano silver all the way to single world carbon nanotube. And then we, for each of them, we, we examined at least the three to five or sometimes six different concentrations. So for each of the material, we did a different concentration. And the y-axis, so the tally number, or so-called so uh, transcranial level effect indicator level, the new uh, endpoint we proposed. As you can see, for all of them we, we examined, they all have those response. Means that as concentration increase, this tally number we propose all increase with concentration. That was really encouraging. That means that whatever the, the way we calculated made some sense. It's actually indicative and, and responsive or show uh, those response type related uh, relationship. So how do I get rid of this? Okay. So with that. I translate that information into a traditional toxicology type of a, a shape, the dose response curve. So now my x axis is a dosing concentration, and y axis is the tally number. Why that keep on showing up? Uh, so here, because, the, uh, because I don't want the figure to be too messy, I only show a number of them as an example but you can get the feeling of it, right? For depending what type of material, the dose response shape are different. Some of them follow the traditional s type of curve. Some are still going on. Some are very flat. Not, for example, annotate, uh, titanium dioxide or rutile are really not that toxic at all during the whole range concentration we observed. So this can help us now to determine the traditional toxicology-based endpoint. And the same figure, the same figure I can also translate into another one Instead of using tally direct number, we did a prob uh, probability translation. Basically, now y axis, so as a probit unit, this is the way normally toxicology people do. And the x axis is the concentration. So, with this kind of curve, now we can determine multiple endpoints based on this. For example, slope, as you can tell, depending on different material, the slope is indicative what, how fast this causes toxicity with increased concentration. You can measure the lowest threshold number, so-called NOTL, right? You can arbitrarily pay, pick a threshold number. See, this is my lowest detection limit. You can determine NOTL. And you can also determine tally 50, which is very similar to EC50, right? No, no, most people are familiar with toxicology. We always use EC50. It means like half of the maximum response you can observe, either half, per, half percent of the total death or half percent of 100% inhibition. So you can also calculate tally 50. So 50% 50 of the maximum response you can observe. So with all this, now you can put all these endpoints together. I'm thinking, OK, all these endpoints now can be obtained. And to validify them, the first thing I can do is to calculate the correlation coefficient with all the endpoints we can obtain with this method compared to other literature reported endpoints. So it's kind of a big table, but the key, key information is at the bottom, the one highlighted ones I want to point out is that the x on top, so-called tally max, slope, tally 50, OTL, that are the four endpoints come out from our proposed method. And normally, EC50 only respond to the 50 point, like 50% effect. But to reflect the entire toxic effect over a larger range of concentration range, you really need to multiple endpoints to give you the overall characteristic of that toxic response. So we have the four different endpoints proposed. Then on the, uh, on the column, first column, OTL, I already explained that. That's currently accepted. 
And the EC50, that's currently accepted, the typical one. And the BOD is another new one proposed by uh, Professor Bellow School from UMass Law. And they're measuring the ROS production in human serum of nanomaterial exposure as an indirect way to measure how toxic a nanomaterial is. So basically, they're measuring ROS production in the human serum. And I put that in there too. So as you can tell, our OTL and the traditional OTL agree relatively well. So they are making similar sense. And we found our it's actually more sensitive uh, compared, to, compared to, to the traditional OTL. And then the, and then the max tally correlates the best with EC50, which go back to my comment earlier, because max tally indicating the highest concentration of the stress response, almost pushing, pushing to the threshold, may eventually lead into phenotype damage or change. And it's kind of making sense it's correlated with EC50, which is phenotype-based indicator point. And we found surprisingly, most of the parameters we propose are correlated really well with BOD, which indicating that oxidative stress, our expression, is probably truly the dominating mechanism for all nanomaterial as widely accepted. So not end of the story yet. The last question I want to ask with all this is that, OK, now we have end point. We can compare toxicity. We can screen them. And my further question is that, since we have the two-dimensional fingerprint, and they are so sensitive, so much information, and I'm thinking, can we actually use this two-dimensional fingerprint to help us actually classify compounds based on their mode of action? And even further, can we even possibly identify compounds if they're so sensitive, so much information in it? So that's, with that question, what we did exercise is that, OK, I said, let's do some clustering analysis. And, but in the first question, my student answered back to that, well, but April, I cannot find any software online that can do a kind of two-dimensional gene expression clustering. <laughs> so, so what we, we, we figured out, we worked around a, a little bit. So recently, I think the student finally came up with a MATLAB scheme, developed something uh, that can do <laughs> clustering of the information we have with the time and all the genes across it. So to give you a visual, basically, as you can imagine, that three-dimensional mountain-looking thing, it's like one fingerprint of one exposure, one compound. And the one on top is another exposure at a different concentration. We basically want to tell among all of the many of the sectors that are who and who are most close, have the most similar contour. It's almost like a facial structure recognition or pattern recognition, very similar to that. And so here's what we come up with. When we do the three-dimensional cluster analysis, we found really, really encouraging result. If you look at the right-hand side, all the titanium dioxide with different concentration cluster together, all the nano silver cluster together, all the single one nanotube with different concentration cluster together. And all the bottom ones at the really low concentration, now they group together. So what we learned from this is that as we expected, the two dimensional information are specific enough to basically tell the compound if you're all, all nano silver, even though at the different concentration you are changing, but there's something conserved about the mode of action, conserved enough to have them group together. That at the same time, the beautiful about thing that it can also differentiate different concentration. It's not like all group one together. And then this cl classroom works only for that range I mentioned. If it is concentration too low, then all of them group together because they are all below detection limit. If the concentration all too high, then like I said, you're losing the specificity because the master global response. But within a wider range of concentration, you can, you can see this. So that potential can help us classify the compounds as we uh, desire to do. And then we, we further examined that besides just nano material, I said do other material besides nano. So we tried a whole bunch of other environmental pollutants because I have bigger scope for this. And we found similar things. So not just nano material, even for other environmental pollutants, if you are within certain concentration, all the ones with similar mode of action group together. And uh, so once again, you can help use this method to classify compounds based on the MOA. So I think that's all the information for, for what we learned so far. To looking forward, how do we apply all this we learned? And one of the first thing I want to do is I want to, how do I apply this approach in practice, really, for water quality monitoring or for toxicity screening? So the scheme we propose is that if this test can indeed be done cheaply, I mean, grow E. coli cells, once you have one lab, you can multiply as many times as you want without costing nothing. And the procedure is re relatively simple. So if this allow us to do high rate screening of many materials or many pollutants to create a database of all the fingerprints of mode action in this database continuously, 
than if I can create another fingerprint identification machine. Almost like the federal FBI, you put your fingerprint in, it runs like 15 minutes, or face burn tell you like 98 match of something. So I want something like that later on uh, to have a quick, so that's another area without animation, I cannot lead you to the link, but I have a separate project, uh, project develop line along just developing sensors. Because I want something to be online, electrical based, to detect the DNA hybridization or like DNA markers based on electrical signal with nanomaterial as a transducer that we potentially can allow in the future online measurement of this fingerprint. Then if you can have that, you can put it back in the database, then lead to eventually uh, regulation and risk assessment framework as originally we proposed to do. And then another way to incorporate this into the current toxicity and risk assessment framework is through this scheme. So basically you can use this kind of relative resource, less intensive one to do a quick screening of any water sample or new material or new nanomaterial. If NO, less than OTL, you could say, okay, this is unlikely going to cause any significant toxicity. Put on the side. Then if it does have toxicity effect, you not only know it has, you already have some clue what the mode, potential mode of action is, right? And then that would lead to put that information into the database you have. If that mode of action you observe is already being identified earlier, you already can compare to the database, know what mode of action you are, which classification you're belonging to, right? But if you have an uh, observed MOA, go back to database, nothing there. You can just add to the database. But then you can guide all your resources focusing only on that one. Because that's the one not only have toxic effect, I know the clue of mode action, and I know the MOA is new, nobody recognizes. Therefore, I can point all my resources to do all the traditional whole organism, whatever screen, the whole gamma or nine yard, to get information Then you can add it to the database for the next round. So I think that's a way can potentially to solve one of the major challenges we asked at the first the beginning of the talk is that how do we handle this larger amount with limited resources. So with that, I come to the conclusions. So what we learned that temporally dynamic gene expression yields compound specific and concentration sensitive profiles. We learned that the specific yet conservative profile allow us to potentially classify and identify compound. And we learned that the, this method allows us and to review toxicity mechanism or MOA of various uh, uh, environmental uh, toxicants. And it's relatively high rate, feasible, and economical, and can allow us to screen larger compounds. And finally, we seem to be able to find endpoints or develop the new endpoints that can be incorporated into toxicity and risk assessment framework to work along with other toxic uh, information. So the project mostly funded by a couple of NIS, NISF award and uh, CDM Dying Howard Scholarship and uh, all my students, postdocs, and who work on the project. Without them, there would be no data. <laughs> Thank you. We don't. We are we are doing more tests on that. Like I'm trying to do more phys physiology based, like a comet test or all the other traditional DNA damage to first confirm because this is just at promoter level. So number one level question, I want to confirm all that. The number two, like you said, I, at this point I really don't know how it get in first or produce ROS and ROS indirectly cause the DNA damage or direct DNA damage. Don't know. We are describing, yeah. But in general, we don't, most people in, in this field agree or don't agree that nanomaterial can enter prokaryotic cells. I think most people think it's unlikely. Mm -hmm. Even though we, sue, ev we see evidence of internalization of it, but we don't know if it is internalized after the membrane already damaged, it gouged in, or it's actually live, live, then somehow get in. Don't know, yeah. One of the slides I showed, we tried like two or three different compounds in mixture. Yeah. Yep. Because it tele -calc calculated the transfer level effect, disregard how many compounds you dispose to it too. 
I guess your question asking is that when you have multiple compounds in the mixture, would the fingerprint or, or conservative signature still reserve? And one of the slides I showed earlier to show yes, we, we tried a couple of them, same with the cluster. Uh, we did a metomycin plus mercury, then, then put the mixture, then get the fingerprint and match the in database. It get clustered most close with mercury and the metomycin. But maybe just for this too, but you can have synergistic, antagonistic. You can have many complex, uh, complex the reaction between mixtures. It whether for other materials together or different combination together with it or not, I, I don't know. We have to test it to know. That's one of the things we're continue to work on. Uh, well, to answer that, from, from, from a methodology point of view, that of course you have to do many replicates, like we did many replicates, we observe what is reliable confidence level of reproducibility. And so when we do the, like the indicator changing, so-called changing calculation, we cut a very conservative noise baseline. Like for example, for us, uh, line I less than 0.5, we consider noise level. It's almost like you have to change to at least threefold and above to be, in our case, considered positive. That may actually screen out some real changes, but we, we stayed on the conservative side. So that's just from the data processing, statistic analysis, and error proof point of view. But from a bigger picture, how, how can you sure that the transcription level effect, the promoter effect, really eventually lead to phenotype damage, long term or short term? I think that's a larger scale question. Probably need a collaboration to do really multi-cell line Multi, you know what I mean, a multi-approach, multi-cell line, same time together to see are the endpoints consistent with each other? Can they correlate? I think that's actually one of the major initiatives under EPA's TOX21 is to do this type of similar approach but with multiple cell lines with different level of cell, prokaryote or eukaryote, to see if this framework do they in line with each other. Can you aid with toxic uh, computation toxic to aid with this endpoints consistent with each other? That's, yeah, that's something I think everybody is quite... Uh, Working towards, yeah. Uh, question is that the concentration for all of these different nanomaterials uh, of which your um, overall metric was calculated, uh, the effective concentration is very similar, similar order, order of magnitude, the no effect concentration, and then the integrated um, effect concentration. I don't remember the exact expression, but they're, they're all similar order of magnitude. Is this what you expect? So the no effect concentration, for example, was all uh, pretty much very uh, similar concentration. And, um, uh, no? Oh, it is, no. Uh, the, the, for, for the OTL level, yes. the, they are seem to be in the range of around 1. Yes. A lot of them like 0 0.7, 0 0.8. And lowest one we observe, the lowest one I forgot, it's silver or there is one really, really low, one organ magnitude lower. But majority, you're right. The ones we examined at least is in their range. But then, I, I don't know, either because maybe the NOTL is just not sensitive enough of a measurement, just basically means whoever, you have to get to a certain level, or could it be just for all the material we examined, if they're, like we said, if their toxic damage dominating just by ROS production, it could just be, there's really not much difference in the amount of ROS it can produce per unit of time. So common or common? Could, it could be, yeah, it could be. But we examined our, like MMC, uh, mercury, other uh, non-nano toxicant, they are different. The one you observe only for the nanomaterial because they seem to be similar. For the other ones, they are one much lower ones, yes. I think that's the common challenge people always ask for environmental related ecotoxic work, right? We all recognize, even for the same prokaryote cell bacteria, you pick a different strain, pseudomona, E. coli, they all respond to different things differently. Of course, across prokaryote to eukaryote, it's even more. And you even mentioned about bioavailability. How do you know they're bioavailable or can cross-member the same way with different cells? 
but which is which I think this is this is a challenge for all toxicology period because nobody can have the resources to examine all cell lines all different strains all different cells right we just cannot do that so like anything else we pick indicator or pick indicator organ as long as everybody agree this is what we're looking at the same play field the same standards and you can relatively compare them that's it but if you want to go down to really detail no for this particular material, what is toxic effect on human? Of course, you cannot infer the, uh, completely from it. You have to do completely separate systematic approach for your, but depending on the question and your objective. For our case, I just want to know if there's 8,000 compounds come out. If without this, you know nothing about these 8,000 compounds. With this, at least I can tell you the first layer of information. Then we can start from there, depending on what your next questions are. There will be, there, see, because of, my focus is more ecotoxicology, so I'm more interested in the in impact on the ecosystem. And prokaryotic cells is majority por por portion of the eco, eco web or any aquatic system. So it is directly relevant for ecotoxicity. But at, at the same time, I already mentioned earlier, you do need to do different cell line, a cross cell line check and a consistency examination. But that's the next bigger goal many toxicologists are working on.